our class. Um, sure. And what we're up to, I'm gonna put my headphones in. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this is a class for National Lewis University, which is in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I graduated from this program about 15 years ago. And I think it's mostly moved online. I think they do have some face-to-face -face classes, but a lot of it is online now. And uh, this is a technology and education cohort. Um, and we have about 11 students in the class right now. And some of them may join us. Some of us, some of them may watch this after, after the fact. And I am recording at this time. Last week I didn't, unfortunately. I, I screwed up on that. So this is going to be covered. This is going to be recorded, and they can watch it later and respond to questions and things like that. Cool. Um, most of the teachers are 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 in the classroom. I think we have one that's working for National Lewis University, so she's at the higher ed level. But mm -hmm. I still think Ed Surge, what Ed Surge does, is applicable to everyone, particularly now since you have a higher ed section. Mm -hmm. um, and there and these guys are really sharp. So. Um, we're really trying to focus on not just tools for tools sake, but really on the pedagogy behind the tools and what goes into it. And for my students who are in the room, I'll let Mary Jo tell you a little bit about her background. But the reason I thought she would be fun to have um, here is because for A, EdSearch is probably the leading ed tech news source out there. It's your go-to source of everything related to this sort of thing. Secondly, they're based in Silicon Valley, and I think kind of understanding the Silicon Valley mindset and what it go, what's involved with startups and companies that are thinking about how to help teachers and that sort of thing, um, that's what Ed Surge does, and that's what Mary Jo is really good at. So I think that perspective will be really interesting to add on to our discussions. And then on top of this, um, next hour, we have Chris Hull, who I think you actually might have, Mary Jo, or Ed Surge did mm -hmm. an article about him a while ago. And he is, uh, for, the, for the people who don't know Chris, he is still in the classroom. He's a middle school teacher in Highland Park. And he started this with a, he's a co-founder with another teacher uh, of a learning management system, which I don't think they would call it that now. I think they have a different name for it, um, called Otis. And it's based here, obviously, in Chicago. It's been funded. And um, I think it really started as an iPad platform, but it's for all devices. So Chris is going to join us in the second hour. And I think the perspective of, of, of him as a teacher, uh, teacherpreneur, who's still in the classroom, that's really kind of a rarity, um, will kind of enhance this, uh, you know, serendipitously. I didn't really plan it this way, but it just, I just thought this would be a good mix and I got lucky and you guys agreed to do this. So, um, so let's start out and I'm, I have a Padlet for everybody too, by the way, to ask questions. Um, it's in the chat. I'll post it in there again. Um, oh, I think everybody can see it, but in case you can, if you don't see it, I'll, I'll post it in there. And if you will have any questions for, um, for Mary Jo or for Chris during this, and you, and you want to take notes and that sort of thing, use the Padlet. We'll do it um, as kind of a collective exercise and, and play it around with another tool while we're, while we're learning tonight. So without further ado, um, why don't we start out, Mary Jo, with you telling us who you are mm -hmm. and what EdSurge does. That would be a really good start for tonight. Sure, happy to do so. Um, and if I cut out at any time, just shoot me a little comment below. Um, so uh, thank you, Lucy, for that great introduction. So my name is Mary Jo Mata, and I have played a lot of roles at EdSurge. My, my recent role is Director of Audience Development, where my job is to basically figure out and lead initiatives around helping give our audience what we what they want and then also um, finding new and great communities for us to enter ourselves into. Um, so my background is definitely in teaching. Um, I started out in Houston teaching for the KIPP system and then I moved um, to Los Angeles and taught in the Catholic school system down there for a while. Two very different experiences. Um, I also got interested in technology because prior to Los Angeles Unified School District's disastrous one-to-one -one iPad initiative that the LA Times wrote about for many, many months, um, the Catholic school system actually went through a miniature version of that. Uh, there was some pressure to keep up with the charter schools, and so they invested money in iPads, which didn't go so well. And so kind of going off of that experience, I decided to go back and get a master's in education and technology because I thought to myself, I got to figure out what all this is about. Um, and uh, while I was at the Harvard Graduate School of Education getting that degree, I started reading Ed Surge a lot, um, met Tony, the managing editor in the event, uh, chatted with Betsy Corcoran, and sort of the rest, as they say, is history. I've been here for the past four years 
um, started out as a, a writer and an editor, then became a senior editor, and I've always focused on K-12. So from the perspective of what EdSurge does, um, we are, you know, you'll get people who refer to us as the tech crunch of education, but I think of us as a lot more than that because we report on everything related to ed tech from products to school models to what teachers are doing in the classroom to make practices more successful. But we also host events and have a job board to help connect great talent with ed tech companies and schools that are looking for people who are interested and skilled in technology. Um, so once you guys get these degrees, if any of you are interested in finding a new <laughs> role, you can let us know. Um, and then about a year, year and a half ago, we launched um, a more full-scale higher ed initiative. So we'd always focused predominantly on K-12, uh, but then with some gentle prodding from some of our readers and the Gates Foundation, we decided to go full-scale higher ed as well. Um, I also must say I am a huge fan of some of the education practices going on in Chicago. My entire family's from Chicago and my sister is a comedian at the Second City. So as a, yeah, I don't know if you knew that, Lucy. But no. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've never been to Second City. That's so cool. Oh, that is a travesty. I, I, I've gotten a, a friend who was in, a, uh, in an improv class there and um so I've been to like their classes, like the, the productions they do for their classes, but not for the real thing. But my you would love my friend because um her sister was head of writing for for second city oh really and about i don't know five six years ago this is katie mcknight if anybody here in the audience knows wow. her she used to teach for national lewis and she wrote a book on improv in the classroom with her sister. My sister that. yeah and and mary unfortunately dropped dead um five six seven years ago it's been a while now but she was uh yeah so they're really connected to that but i've i've sadly i've actually never been to second city which is Maybe we, maybe we need to have a class meet up there. Anyway, so your sister is a, a comedian there? <laughs> I should say more trying to be. She's in some of the improv shows. Um, on I think she's in one on the main stage and then a couple off off the main stage. But uh, yeah. And, That's uh, huge. <laughs> she's this pretty is, funny. <laughs> this is a side note, but did you ever, have you seen the movie The Big Sick yet? I haven't, but I oh. really want to see it. I thought the guy's name sounded familiar in it. And he was mm -hmm. actually, when I started working for the University of Chicago Charter Schools, he was a tech support guy there. And I don't remember meeting him, but he was doing stand-up in Chicago at the time. And mm -hmm. so all the teachers are going to see him, you know, a couple times, you know, at the beginning of the school year. And then all of a sudden he was like moving to New York and look at him now. But yeah, I mean, there you go. Here. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Keep going. I, I, I feel a real sense to comedy because I also went to Northwestern, which uh, is the, uh, you know, the ground where, um, uh, not Steve Carell, who's the host of the late Colbert. night show. Yeah, Colbert. I mean, he was he his woman's partner. roommate. They were roommates at one point. So yes, it, go, it goes around. Yeah. yeah. That is a very small world to say the yeah. least. Um, sorry, that co comedy is a different thing that yeah. I don't expect any of you thought we were going to chat about. Um, but yeah, so, um, you know, when it comes to Ed Surge, I would say that we, we are based in, in the Bay Area, um, but we travel everywhere. And I would say over the last four years, I've probably written a collective total of 400 articles about education technology, and I've probably edited close to about 300. So it's safe to say that anyone on the editorial team here, including our CEO, Betsy Corcoran, um, has, has seen, experienced, and written a lot about what is happening and or not happening in the ed tech space. Um, and so because of that, it is uh, both easy to see the role that Silicon Valley has played in the positives and also easy to see the role that Silicon Valley has played in the negatives as well. And being in this role, we have a very nuanced uh, view of what technology can do. It can be a great tool, but it also doesn't replace the work of incredible teachers, even though I think there are some entrepreneurs out there that may think that. Chris not included. I think being a classroom teacher still, Chris very much realizes the utility of teachers that tech could never replace. But there are some folks out there that in the back of their head, I think, imagine maybe a day where every student is taught virtually. And, and that is not a world that I ever think will ever happen 100 percent. no 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 so oh, yeah I, I yeah. totally agree i and i think that's i think that's the direction where a lot of i think that's yeah i agree with you and i think it's important that you guys are are reporting on this because until you until ed Surge, uh was born nothing existed to kind of vet this for, for teachers in a, mm -hmm. in a in a non-biased way a lot of the publications that you see out there 
are driven by advertising and by sponsors and that sort of thing. It's not quite a, a news journalism approach to mm -hmm. things, I think. Um, so I think it's really important that you guys do this. Uh, anyway, I, the, the other piece, I, I forgot to mention this too. The other reason I wanted you to talk to or why we're doing these guest speaking roles, mm -hmm. this is a little bit off topic, is because I think bringing people to the teachers to see is important. And you went to Harvard and I was visiting there last summer. I was in the area and went to a class that a friend of mine uh, was a teacher assistant for, for Chris Didi. I don't know if you mm, have. We do. Yeah. Betsy is a big fan yeah. of Chris I love, I love Chris Didi. And yeah. so I went to this lecture that they had with the CEO of NetDragon, which is this huge Chinese company. You may be familiar with it. Yep. And he was going to do a J term. The CEO was going to do a J term um, class or something there at, at some point, but he was kind of giving an overview of some new product they had. And mm -hmm. I thought that this, it, it was um, such an incredible opportunity for people in that room to be in his presence. And, mm -hmm. and, and how many teachers ever get that opportunity to be around people who are really at the forefront of things. And, mm -hmm. and um, so that's why I'm having you come in here because I think it's, it's, it, we can leverage technology a <clears throat> to bring people in, but also I think it's really important that people ha are exposed to lots of different ways of thinking. And, and then, anyway, that's why you're here. So thank you. Fabulous. <laughs> I hope that I don't yeah, disappoint. Yeah. No, sure. you are. You are. <laughs> okay, so so we're talking about digital tools, and um, why don't you tell us a little bit about? Um, I know. So who's doing the? So what are you doing in, specifically in your new role, role after writing for so long? What are, what are these new opportunities that you're that you're? Is it new partnerships? What's the role again? So it's called the audience development. Partnerships is a small part of that, but there's sort of a lot of different things that um, fall under the category. It's kind of at the nexus of editorial marketing and biz dev. So um, I would equate it to some tech companies have a role that they refer to as a growth hacker or growth manager. It's sort of similar to that. Um, but there is still very much a huge editorial part of it because at this point, you know, we've written a lot about education technology but what we're realizing is that there are a lot of communities of teachers out there that for all intents and purposes don't have access to all of these resources because a they don't have the time or the opportunity to really know where that stuff is and so my solution is sort of we will come to them instead and sort of offer what we have and if they find some utility in it fabulous like let's help you figure out how you can use it oh wonderful okay so, so tell us a little bit about the summits and how that's been going, because that's related sure. to, to probably what you're trying to pitch the startups in terms of helping them. So that's a great question, actually, because we've, we've, we've um, made sort of a big change recently. So um, EdSurge was founded in 2011, and starting in 2013, we started conducting what we were calling summits. Um, summits were essentially large-scale events that we would do in specific regions. Um, never done one in Chicago, unfortunately, but we went to Nashville and Florida, Austin, um, Los Angeles, New Jersey. And what we would do is we would bring 30 companies with us, chosen by a panel of experts in that area, the educators there. And um, the companies would offer their tools and educators would come from around the surrounding area and test them and give feedback. So it was meant to sort of fill the space of, you know, entrepreneurs make tools without necessarily being able to garner a lot of user feedback. Let's help them kind of have that opportunity, especially because it gave the educators a way to sort of be like, hey, this is not good. Please don't give us this feature. This is good. I like this feature. Do this. Um, We've decided to sort of over the last three and a half years of doing that, um, we've actually decided to take that model and split it up into two, uh, sort of taking this medium event and splitting it up into a really tiny event called a tech leader circle and then a larger event called Ed Surge Fusion. Um, and we are going to be running one of these in Chicago. So I encourage anyone who would like to come, please let me know. Um, so the TLCs, or Tech Leader Circles, uh, we're running 50 of these over the course of the next nine months. And what that means is we're going around to cities all across the country, and we're bringing together small groups of 30 to 50 educators and administrators in that area. We're actually keeping the entrepreneurs out. This is only meant for you guys. And the idea is so you can talk about education technology without actually feeling the pressures coming in from maybe having the companies around you. 
Because that was one of the big questions we got. A lot of educators said, look, I really need to talk with other people who are in the classroom about ed tech. I can't, I feel like I can't do that at these summits as much as I would like. So um, we did a small one in Chicago uh, about three or four months ago, and we're going to be doing another one probably uh, this coming fall. And so those are the small versions. And then we're doing a big national conference called Ed Surge Fusion, and that's going to be in November. And so that is going to be bigger than summits in the sense that people are actually going to be traveling from all over the country and parts of the world too, but mostly national to come together and talk about education, technology, personalized learning, and all of the different steps it takes to really implement programs into schools and districts. Um, so that's going to be fun because it's going to be a bit of a different flavor from what we've normally done. It's also going to give you folks or whoever ends up coming an opportunity to connect with people that are, you know, national as opposed to just regional. Um, so it's a little bit of kind of each, but if I can tell you anything from my own experience, when we were in Los Angeles and this iPad one-to-one -one program was going south, I didn't really have any connections to anyone that I felt like could back up my claims when I was going to the principal and saying, there are some major issues with this that we need to resolve. Better PD. You need to prime the teacher, the parents and the students more, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So creating those connections is definitely a big part of why we've been doing events and we'll continue doing them until eternity. Where is this conference taking place? Is it in California or is it in Las Vegas? It, this so there is a another conference called Fusion that is in yeah. Las Vegas. Ours is taking place in uh, San Francisco. Okay, because I'm looking at the events and it, that's what came up when I searched for it. Okay, I'll find the link to it. Cool. Um, so is it? And I, when I looked at it at first, it seemed to be about blended and personalized learning. And mm -hmm. um, let's can we debunk that a little bit because I think sure. uh, there was an article about ISTE. Either you guys wrote or ISTE wrote interviewing, I think it was you guys, um, interviewing people like Jenny McGarra about buzzwords that they wanted. Things to that they were tired of. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and blended learning is, and I am totally in agreement with Jenny about blended mm -hmm. learning. I think it's gotten, um, it's vague. People don't know what it looks like. Uh, mm -hmm. When I did a project for Ed Surge last year, I interviewed a lot of the blended learning people and I got a little bit a better sense of it. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it coming from Heather Staker and Michael Horn's book, uh, mm -hmm. Blended. Um, but there's, I'm wondering, and, and, and here in Chicago, I'm noticing that parents are starting to get a little worried about this, particularly in Chicago public schools. Mm -hmm. There is um, a parent group that's pretty active and uh, politically in the system, mm -hmm. and they're very suspicious of technology. They're very suspicious of CPS's motives with technology. And of they course. And they don't always get it. And they're an awesome group. And even when I try to step in and say, well, hey, that's not what they're trying to do, it, it's not really met with... Um, with open arms. So mm -hmm. if we could kind of uh, talk about what, what blended and what personalized means, um, I think that would be really helpful. And then we, maybe we can dig into some of the tools. For sure. And I'm gonna give a caveat to this, which is um, a lot of people come to us and ask us, you know, what is the definition of personalized learning? What is the definition of blended? And the answer I always give people is there is no one definition. You can't, it, it, there's, it's impossible. It's a term that has spiraled out to become something that is more, um, it, 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 what really matters is whatever your community deems as being important in terms of created blended or personalized environments. Um, and I want to say one thing real quick, because I know Paula asked if there's an invitation required for um, Fusion, and the answer is yes, all you got to do is just send, like say, hi, I'm interested, um, and, and we'll give you an invitation right away. That's small in fact, but it's really, it's more to perturb the companies from requesting an invitation because they don't get free access, but educators can get that. Okay, so um, so for those of you that didn't see that, uh, and that would actually maybe be something good to link to loosely, Lucy. Um, I was at ISTE a couple of weeks ago, and uh, ISTE is the biggest ed tech conference in the country. It brings together, I think this year it was 16,000 folks interested in ed tech from 20. everywhere. 21,000. 20, 21,000. 21, okay. Yeah. I think it was, I think the clarification then, I think it was 16,000 educators and then 5,000 companies, sales folks, like nonprofit types, but it's a lot of people. And what's interesting is, you know, normally we always ask one question on the ground, sort of get 
feelings from people. A couple of years ago, it was about privacy. Last year, I think it was about um, what's the one thing, what's the one resource you wish you had in order to do ed tech in your school system better. Um, this year, the question we decided to ask was, what's the thing that you're tired of? What tool, what product, what initiative, what buzzword? And uh, both personalized and blended learning came up as buzzwords that people were tired of hearing about. And I think the reason that they were tired of hearing about them was because I think that those terms have been become a bit bastardized by tech products, but also like large nonprofits, organizations like the Gates Foundation, just saying this stuff over and over and over and over and over again, and trying to push their definitions of what they mean. But at the end of the day, Whatever you dictate is important for you and your students is what matters the most. I've seen incredible examples of personalized learning in schools and districts that really doesn't focus on technology. It focuses on project-based learning. It focuses on rubric systems. Um, and we, we ran um, a research pro project uh, back in December where we actually looked at 15 different schools and districts across the country that were implementing various elements of personalized learning, but we kind of toned in on each of those specific elements. And one of the ones that I was most fascinated by was Lindsay Unified, which is a rural public school system down in Southern California. Um, and their big thing that they focused on with personalized learning was the way that they communicated it to their parents. Um, so the big thing, the big concern I have about Chicago public schools, and I'm going to get on my soapbox for a minute because my parents will call me every couple of days and complain about the budget in Illinois. So I've been hearing this every day for the past, you know, forever, um, is that it was ironic how the budget was getting shafted and yet CPS last year decided to hire a director of personalized learning. And I think that that was very indicative of the fact that even if they were letting go certain, certain cohorts of people, that they were bringing in representatives to handle technology and personalized learning. Now, okay, budget issues aside, I think if CPS wants to do a better job of rolling out initiatives, they're going to have to do a great job of not only communicating to parents and teachers and students how this rollout's gonna take place and educating them on what it means, but taking a step before that and actually bringing in all of those community members to come up with sort of their definition for what they think learning should look like. My biggest concern with big public school districts, and CPS isn't the only one, LAUSD, Houston, all of them, is that when they function on such a grand space, it's hard for them to get the, um, the, or in the favor of stakeholders because the stakeholders feel like they haven't actually been involved in the process of deciding what's going to happen. And with something like technology, which is still a relative unknown for a lot of people in terms of how that contributes to learning, you have to bring the stakeholders in or else you're going to be screwed, if I'm just going to be honest. Um, there was a... Um, a school system down in Los Angeles, a charter school system, where they decided that they wanted students to be on computers for 85% of the day, every day, the whole week. And they didn't choose to tell parents until mid-year. Um, and so the parents were rightfully upset. And then not only were they rightfully upset, but they also started sort of not supporting what the school was doing. And so if students weren't finishing their work in school and they came home and had to do work on the laptop, the parents were like, it's not my problem. You don't obviously care what I have to think. And, you know, I think that's the thing I realized back when I was an educator was every, every relationship around a student is really a triangle. You've got the teacher, you've got the parent, and then you've got kind of the district at the top and the kids in the middle. And if those three groups aren't in line, things just are going to go awry, whether you're talking about technology or not. Okay, hold on. Let me get off my soapbox. Yeah, All well, right. let, let, I can get in my soapbox about CPS from my experience from there. I taught there for a number of years and then went and worked in, a, in the complete opposite in a, in a high-performing um, private school. Um, but... Uh, I don't know, five, six years ago, I got into, got brought back into CPS as a consultant for a guy named John Connolly, who was head of the ed tech tools department. Mm -hmm. And he's the guy who got like some magical grant and decided to go to buy iPads um, with this grant before the, the funding disappeared. And yeah, I think he worked with Apple and he designed a program where they were going to um, have cohorts and the teachers would 
um, have to do PD with each other and at their schools. And, and I think certain classrooms got a full cart. So some schools got to kind of get the feel for one-to-one -one and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. and, the model, and Jenny McGarry was part of that model. Um, a lot of people were that, that yep. are really high flying teachers. And uh, it really worked well. Um, they saw results in their test scores. Not that that was the big driver of everything, but it was a, it was a really good initiative, but it was not sustainable um, for whatever reason. And John moved on. <clears throat> And about Where the, is he now? He's in District 230, which is a big district in the southern suburbs. Where are you from originally, Mary Jo, in, in, in Illinois? So, well, I actually ironically grew up in L.A., but my parents okay. are both from the same street in Oak Park, uh, went to St. Okay. Giles, and then re reconnected later at a 25-year reunion and got married. So Chicago runs through my blood. I'm a oh, big Cubs fan. No offense okay. to all the White Sox fans okay. on the call. I apologize. Okay. Oh, good. Okay, um, We're, yes. you're, on, you're on my page. You're okay. So this is like this is like southwest of the city, uh, District 230. So it's Tinley Park. Oh, it's okay. Like three huge high schools. He's a really thoughtful guy. He listens to a lot of people. He asks people's opinions, and then he kind of implements. And he's not. Um, He's, he's good at, at pleasing people, but he's also like knows when he needs to say, okay, we're going to do this and just does it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that was the, that was the case back when I started doing some work for him. And then I would go around and I would interview teachers for an award that they gave in CPS. And so every year I went to probably, I don't know, 10 to 15 CPS schools and, and saw what they were doing mm -hmm. and um, things were flying around and then slowly but surely he left and then another person left and then a guy named John Melios left. And then the department was like defunct. And, and then, uh, actually, a former student of mine's mother was hired to be the chief of staff to, <laughs> to uh, Forrest Claypool, and she was interested in the blended learning stuff. She wasn't the person in charge of it, but she was interested in it, and now I think she's gone. Mm -hmm. But it's mm -hmm. been a, a systematic, um, there, I don't think there's any, there's a woman that was in our first webinar last week, um, Donna Roman. She worked for CPS mm -hmm. for a while, and it may have been part of that. But there was really, you know, it, it, it was hard to make anything move um, because there wasn't, the whole department had been dismantled. The whole structure that had been keeping things together is kind of not a band-aid, but, you know, a, a shoestring team, mm -hmm. you know, a shoestring budget where they were doing a lot. And now I have no idea what exists there. Um, one of our... Um, one of our students, Doug, is doing consulting work for, for CPS right now. He might know. Doug, yeah. do, you know, do you know what the status is of, the, of, of CPS's ed tech initiatives in general? Do you have any clue? What do you think? I don't know. He might be. Doug, there, he might be. Oh, there, there he is. What do you think? Oh. Doug? Uh-oh. Okay. He'll jump in if he can. All right. He I must do see, he did comment okay, that okay. C CPS needs to let whatever initiative they roll out for more than two years, which I wholeheartedly 100% agree with you, and stop treating every new initiative as a silver bullet, which yeah. I, again, completely makes sense to me. And unfortunately, I kind of blame a little bit of the media and also funders for this, because I think sometimes big districts feel like they need to oversell in order to both get funding and kind of gain yeah. some accolades in the media yeah. to keep people happy but it just ends up setting the bar even higher that if they don't hit it just ends up kind of creating a chain reaction of falling dominoes um yeah cps isn't it's not in a, it's not in, a, in the easiest place right now whether related to ed tech or not no and i and you know we have a budget in illinois now so that's a start but there's still a ways to go and the problem i guess for me is um you know we we do the we we do these kind of experimental initiatives in in large urban schools, but there's no real commitment to sustainability. It's not it's not that they couldn't be sustainable, but there's no commitment to it. And so, um, you know, how are you going? It's it it seems every district around here is one to one Chromebook or iPad for the, in high schools at least I would say, and um, I can think of one in CPS where a principal had some initiative and had some extra money and made it happen, and I don't even know if it's still going. So how can large urban districts in general ever, you know, deal with that inequity um, at the rate, even Chromebook prices are expensive for them. So, you know, that's something that really bothers me is that they had, these schools have no chance of ever even thinking about it unless they, there's, you know, some miracle funding source that's not sustainable. And right. it's, really, it's really unfair to come in, I think, and do something with, with a school. Like I worked on a pilot um, with a company that does broadband, uh, filtered broadband in schools. And it was awesome. We had a great time. I coached the teachers once a month um, and the kids took these devices home and it was great. 
But as I was telling my class last week, you know, then the pilot's over, they get to keep the devices, which is great, but the connectivity is lost. So mm -hmm. that, that, that piece that really kind of fostered the homeschool connection is gone. And they don't, they didn't have the money to keep pay for the, the broadband going right. forward. So it's like giving candy to a baby. You see something that works and you, and the teachers got so used to it. And actually the teacher I worked with the most in that program, she's now in Oak Park, <laughs> but they, 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 it's like taking candy away from a baby. Yeah. So, so anyway, it's just, it's a whole big can of worms and, and um, I don't know what's going to happen to, to change that. Um, go ahead. I was just going to say you kind of talking about the broadband issue reminds me of when we interviewed um, Elena Sanina, who's the director of blended learning for Aspire Public Schools here in Oakland. And uh, they, they have schools all the way up and down California. So I would equate them to kind of a big spread out public school district, even though they're a charter. And they actually have a blended learning readiness assessment that they require every school in their system to take if they want to go blended. And there's three main requirements. First off, you have to have complete Wi-Fi coverage all over your school, and if you don't have it, they are not going to support you on going blended. You have to have a five-year plan. Oh, that was really inappropriate. A five-year plan. Here we go. I put down the wrong finger. Uh, <laughs> a five-year plan for um, how you're actually going to continue funding this initiative, because how are you going to account for broken iPads? How are you going to account for you know everything else coming down the line? And then uh, the last thing is PD. You have to have a five-year PD plan every single year. Um, now, granted, Aspire is small. So when I think of successful large-scale district rollouts, there aren't that many, but the one that I actually like to reference is Houston Independent School District, um, which is the third largest, no, I'm sorry, the fourth largest yeah. uh, district in the country, if you don't count Puerto Rico, and they love making a note that they fall right behind CPS as the biggest district in the country. Um, so Houston actually did something that I thought was really smart, where they partnered with Mooresville, I think it's yeah. Mooresville Unified North School Carolina. District. Yeah, North, North Carolina. Carolina. And so they've spent two years just visiting, talking to the superintendent and the team that he had, seeing kind of how this small district went went one to one um, and and then figured out how they could kind of take elements of that and and bring it to Houston Independent School District but they didn't just roll out everything like LAUSD did where they just kind of gave iPads to everybody you know Houston has spent the last four years doing the power up program where they did you know 13 schools got Chromebooks this year then the next year another 13 but then that group of previous 13 schools became mentors for the 13 and so on and so forth so they sort of did a slow burn now it's going to be interesting to see what happens next year because um Tyr and Greer who was the superintendent at that time is no longer there he he left the district so you know changes in leadership tend to be kind of rough for for ed tech rollouts as I'm sure yeah. um, Doug has thoughts about but um, if so there's anything in, yeah and he in Houston um, so this, there's a little bit of tie into COSIN with this I believe mm -hmm. because uh, uh, Lenny Shad was the mm -hmm. was the CIO of Katie Texas and was really successful with their one-to-one -one program it was actually it was a BO, BYOD program and I at the time I ran an initiative for COSIN on mobile mm -hmm. learning and so mm -hmm. he was on my little committee and he was awesome. And, and I haven't really tracked him since he went to Houston. I knew that they had gone one-to-one -one maybe with HP devices or something, mm -hmm. but I really haven't paid attention to it. But I do know that also Coaston was very interested in Mooresville and Mark Edwards, who was the superintendent there at the time, who hasn't been for the last year or two at least. Yeah, he's um, been going for a while. Yeah, and their, and their digital transformation. So Coaston has been having cohorts that have gone and traveled to, and I don't know if, if if, if uh, Houston was part of that, um, have traveled to, to Mooresville for their, I think they have like monthly tours and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if that's still going on with Coaston or not, but I know, I, I have a feeling that's all interrelated because Lenny was a big Coaston person and, and that sort of thing. So I'm sure that was a part of it. The, Lenny and Terry were sort of like best buds, right? That's another thing is that I find when a superintendent wants to go one-to-one, -one, he has sort of a right-hand man, you know? Yeah. Every Steve Jobs has his Wozniak. He has somebody who can really kind of let them lead the operations. Yeah. But Terry served the role of being the spokesperson so he could get funding for H, you know, HISD and apply for grants and sort of put, put the name and the face against it. And then Lenny was the one in the background really doing a lot of the work. Yeah, and I don't think, um, I don't think Lenny was an educator by trade. 
Like, mm-hmm. I think he came from, you know, purely IT or, you know, in general, but he could, he learned to really talk the talk. Like that was, he understood the learning that was happening. He was mm-hmm. very conversant. He wasn't just, just a, a, a bolts and nuts or wires and kind of guy. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so it'll be interesting to see if they keep it up. But that's, that's another key part of this is the, is the leadership. If you don't have the leadership and the vision behind it, I don't see very many programs carrying on past the next person necessarily. So I'm I- sure anybody on this call can attest to the fact that if you don't have a leader in the classroom or in the district, no matter whether it's tech related or not, it's probably not going to go too well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit. So blended learning. Mm-hmm. Let me just go over what I think it is. Um, yeah. When I think of blended learning, it's a blended, you know, traditional and non-traditional approaches to education. It is thinking about the different models that are in that one book called Blended, which I'll put the link to into in the chat. Mm-hmm. Um, station rotation and all these things. But to me, it's not. Is it the same name of what we've been doing with tech integration for years? You know, I, I, you know, I, I'm in these communities with, you know, the Apple Distinguished Educator community with these really high flying teachers. What's that? You know, when we've been integrating multimedia and project based learning and all these things together, isn't that the same mm-hmm. as blended? I mean, is this just an old, a new name for what tech savvy teachers have been doing for years? Right. Well, I mean, I think that's a really important question and one that more people should ask when it comes to the way that they yeah. integrate tech. I can say from my, observations that I put blended learning into a separate category sometimes from teachers using technology because what I observe is that sometimes even the tech savviest teachers aren't actually changing up their classroom to be student centered or student directed meaning that the child actually has or or teenager or adolescent has a little bit more input and control over how and what they're learning um you know, it's kind of sad to me, for example, rocket ship, but when I, wor- when I walk, into, walk into a rocket ship classroom, they're this, so for those of you who have heard about rocket ship, yeah. you know, but for those of you who haven't, rocket ship was one of these kind of super hyper progressive kind of, ooh, this is yeah. interesting, systems uh, that started a number of years ago where they wanted to do blended learning. But whenever I walk into a rocket ship classroom, here's what I see. I see students in rows, facing forward, all sitting on their computers just like this. And I guess it's student-centered in the sense that the child is ultimately driving the, uh, the learning because they're, you know, the one who's in control. But I don't consider really them in control because it's still a program telling them what to do. And they're, they're not interacting with each other. There's no development of social-emotional skills. Yeah. And so because of that, when I, what I consider to be a real blended environment is when the student is placed kind of in the center and the teacher is supporting the student, but working with them in tandem instead of like you telling me what to do. Um, I also don't think that you can have a really blended environment unless there is still some noise in the classroom. Um, you think, okay, the concept of blending is you take two separate entities and you blend them together to make something totally new. I don't see sometimes something totally new. What I see is the same environment with a little bit of technology sprinkled on top. It's sort of like a bagel that just has some sesame. The the sesame seeds aren't actually, um, cooked into the bagel or like a part of the bagel. It it doesn't seem to be talking about the pedagogy behind things very much. Yeah. You know, and that's, it's just a better way of maybe managing the technology. Mm -hmm you know, than anything. Um, the thing with, the, back to your comments about rocket ship, Ron Huberman, who was the CTO, or that CTO, he was the CEO or whatever of CPS for a while, uh, three or four years, maybe five years, six years ago. I can't remember. There's been so many. But he went and saw rocket ship in, apparently in um, California and loved it so much that he decided to implement it here. And what was problematic was they were putting teacher assistants in in the rooms with the computers with kids mm-hmm. you know to, and instead of teachers until mm-hmm. instead of certified teachers and 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 again that's an example probably of removing the teacher from the equation which is not what we think is the best way to do it so no. he um, they tried it here a little bit and uh the, the other piece of this too is like we're, we're doing these things like would that ever work in a high income you know, affluent, highly educated area. Would anybody, the way that we're being experimental with, with the populations that we think need the most work, mm-hmm. 
just seems a little problematic to me. And that's a whole other bag of worms. But like we, the philosophy of education reform in general seems to be if we work kids harder, faster, more, better, that they're magically going to have better test scores and then they're magically going to become more successful in life. Right, right. It's so much more than that. And, um, and I don't think a computer is going to take away or, or make that the teaching more efficient. Right. So I think that's what has been the problem with me, why I've always been so skeptical about this stuff. When I interviewed a bunch of Silicon Valley type people for this blend, the, it was um, a school re redesign model that, that Christina was working on. Yeah. Um, it was really interesting. I can't remember which school it was. It was in that area. It might have been one of the Spire ones, but I could be wrong. I talked to a principal there. I said, what does blended learning look like in your school? And he goes, well, we're using Newzella and we're doing this and we're doing that. And, this, and that's so problematic for me. It's like um, it, it wasn't describing what looks and feels and, and how that changes the learning. It was talking about right. kind of tools. Right. And, um, and it's just like I, I, I worked with another school district where I asked the principals what their, their philosophy of reading instruction was. And mm -hmm. this principal said, oh, we're using National Geographic's, you know, reading series. And I'm like, really? That's not a philosophy. That's not like, it's not like you're using Fountas and Pinnell or, you know, Lucy Calkins or whatever. It's not, it's not a pedagogical foundation from which to build on. It's a, right. a basal and you could substitute technology for that, right? right. So, right. so many people don't understand what the drivers are and it's, that's alarming to me. And I think what we're trying to do in this class is kind of like, how can we get beyond that? Because I think it's very natural for people to get, get really excited about the tools and the things that they're using. And, yeah. we, and I, I don't think, one thing that we've talked about in this class is that we don't think colleges of education have done a really great job of, of, of really helping people understand, how, how, understand the philosophical aspects of what they're doing and how that applies and how you can it apply, it applies to your practice in a continuing way. You know, this, I felt like it was missing from my undergraduate experience and certainly from my graduate experience. Well, yeah, I mean, I can't even, I, I can't even think, I mean, yeah, I don't think most, when I was at Harvard, most of the, the um, students that I knew that were in the uh, teacher education program didn't take any of the ed tech classes that I was taking using technology in the classroom 101, um, you know, and that was the Harvard Graduate School of Ed, God willing. Um, it's funny because I the the scholar that I really love reading is Larry Cuban because he has become so yeah <laughs> he has become so good at and he's he's told me this straight to my face he's like look you can't change people's inherent belief about technology they either like it or they don't it is what it is um, you also can't change their inherent beliefs about pedagogy it's they they like something or they don't like it it is what it is but at the very least you can go see it and judge it for yourself. And what's ironic is that Larry was a professor of education at Stanford when Diane Tavener, the founder of Summit Public Schools, was a student there. She is a former student of his. And public schools is probably one of the most prolific when it comes to bringing technology into the classroom and creating a model around it. Um, and he has been, re you know, visiting, kind of opening himself up to the possibility and he rec recognizes that there are some pretty great things that somebody is doing with technology but he also is very skeptical and I love how he describes what what did he tell me we did a podcast with him and I think the quote that he said was because I said I was a cynic even though I don't think that's true but while, while I was talking to him I was like I'm becoming more cynical as this goes on and he went it's not about being about being skeptical uh, cynical it's about being a healthy skeptic and a diehard optimist Skepticism is good because it makes sure that you are looking for the legitimacy in things. And then optimism is what you can retain to ensure that you're, you're keeping your skepticism with, a, with an eye for making things better. And I always thought that that was great. But if you don't read his blog, I highly recommend it. Oh my gosh, I, I, yeah. I, that's so spot on. And I, I used to think, I mean, he was big probably when I, when did I start all this? I don't know. I, I went through this program 15 years ago. So let's say in the 10, last 10 to 15 years, Mm -hmm. you know, my interest in this has really grown. And I want to say early on, he was probably one of the first people that was doing a lot of stuff around this. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't, pay to, I didn't pay that much attention to him for a long time because I thought he'd become kind of a cynic. Yeah. And, and then he was been doing this series in the last year or two where he's yeah. been going into the schools and yep. documenting exactly what he sees and very, you know, thoughtfully and not, um, you know, kind of dissecting what they're doing. 
Mm -hmm. And um, so, that, so I just put his, his blog in the chat and you guys should definitely look at that. Yeah, I totally forgot. Yes, he's fabulous. Absolutely. No, but I think you make a good point, Lucy, which is that I think he was very cynical for a while, but I also think that part of that was because he actually wasn't going into schools and seeing for himself what was going on. I, as all of you know, because you are educators slash have been educators slash will continue to be educators, everyone has very strong opinions about education because everybody went to school, but the experiences that most adults had in schools is, is not representative of what is happening nowadays. So you're basically trying to, on the daily basis, and I see this every day, get, get, get people to understand it from your perspective while also trying to work within their own mental constraints of what they believe is education, which is both influenced by their own personal beliefs and what they experienced as a child. So basically this is the hardest job in the world. And I'm surprised you are not alcoholics because this is <laughs> one of the hardest things I think anybody in life ever has to do. And it's gotten harder, I think. I mean, yeah. I left the classroom for sure. Here's, here's what, can you tell us a little bit about Summit? Because I think it's really sure. interesting and they definitely had a presence at ISTE. And then, um, I, then I would like to get into a little bit of the tool stuff and what you're mm -hmm. seeing um, coming out of Silicon Valley. What are some of the trends? And particularly around learning management systems, we, you know, what's, mm -hmm. what's with all the learning management systems? Because that's something that we're talking about this week sure. um, and we'll lead into with Chris's um, talk. So anyway, let, tell us about Summit. Let's start with that. Cool. I'll have some so, more questions too. Sure. So Summit is, um, it was started in the Bay Area. Um, the founder of Summit actually never used to use technology when Summit was first founded. That is not something that came until later. Diane Tavner, who had a background in education, had wanted to create a charter school system, much like KIPP, not, not like KIPP's model, but in the same mission as KIPP to help low-income kids be able to basically get equitable opportunities and resources. Um, they struggled the first couple of years, though, and... After a while, she decided, okay, let's try our hand with technology. And, you know, they went back, they talked with the community, they talked with the students, and what they decided was, we're going to make it more student-directed, and we're going to use technology to become a part of that. So what that means is, every year, the entire education is in the students' hands. They have a collection of curriculum and materials that they have to get through from September to May, and all of that is delivered to them in the form of playlists. So teachers, though I'm not, it, it, they're almost more like, like facilitators, I can't almost consider them teachers, are basically there to help the students kind of figure out how to structure their time. Um, and then also there to serve as mentors on projects and group work and things like that, as well as to work with the students that are really far behind in a one-on-one -on -one capacity. Because since the teachers aren't really teaching these full-scale classes, they can work with the students in small groups who really seem to be falling behind on their playlists or not performing on their assessments. Um, if you walk into a summit school, it's very odd because first of all, there's no classrooms. It's sort of this like big, long stretch of space with kids just kind of dotted all over the place amongst different grade levels. And then there's little breakout rooms on the sides where they'll have small group meetings or one-on-one -on -one sessions or assessment spaces. Um, and there's kind of a gentle buzz going through the air, but teachers are sort of walking around. It's, it, it feels almost like the inside of um, an open space office or a co-working space. Now, Summit has also had an interesting history over the last couple of years because they got the eye of Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg walked into one of their schools just one time. He had heard about it and said, this is interesting. I like this tool that I see. So he gave a bunch of money and Facebook engineering support to help Summit develop their personalized learning playlists into something that they call now the PLP. Um, and what they've done is they've started this program called Basecamp where schools can come in and learn how to use Basecamp in their own systems and take it back to Denver and Vegas and Chicago, wherever they want to use it. Um, I want to give a caveat. Summit is one model. It's not the silver bullet. I think some people think it's the silver bullet, but it's not going to solve everything. It's a model that works in certain places with certain people. Um, so there, just keep that in mind. Is there a big PBL focus in there too? For some reason, I thought that there was, they did something that I thought was made them stand out, not just the, the, mm -hmm. the playlist bit, but I, I thought there was something else like they, 
they have an advisory or there's a project-based learning piece or there's something else that's part of it. I'll have to look into it. Maybe I'm mixing it up with some other school, but I was actually pleasantly surprised who, whatever school I'm thinking of mm -hmm. that it, it, it kind of um, defied what my preconceptions were. But, so, yeah, I, you know, Summit, I, I don't consider them to be at the forefront of project-based learning. I think that they bring projects in as a way that students can sh show that they have um, mastered a standard. Um, and, student, you know, projects are a part of the assessments, so students do have to do projects throughout the year. But I don't particularly see anything quite innovative about the ways that they're running projects. You know, they do it the same as what I did when I was a science teacher, you know. Are, are the kids like assigned to cohorts or something? Is there some sort of structural thing that's different? Mm -hmm. Well, when it's, it's I'm thinking of then. it might be that students can, I think, work with other students, even if they're not in the same grade level on projects, because it depends on what sort of standards you're working yeah. on. You know, sometimes if a seventh grader is still kind of struggling with a sixth grade standard, that was sort of one that, you know, they went over and you would normally go over in September and then move on to the seventh grade material. Then if there's a particularly high sixth grader, maybe they'll partner together, but that doesn't, I don't think happen that okay. frequently. Okay. Yeah. So we've got like 10 minutes left. And I want to make sure I get to everybody's questions. Sure, 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 sure. So, so, so the speed talking here. So what, yeah. do you, what what's the latest exciting stuff that you guys are seeing at EdSurge in terms of ed tech trends and things that are taking off and things that are not taking off? And uh, is anybody finding the ever elusive business model <laughs> in, in Silicon Valley? Well, um, one thing I will say that I'm a little worried about is I am concerned that Edmodo is not going to be able to stick around for that much longer um, because they have not figured out how they're making money. And do any of you guys use Edmodo? I'm curious if any of you do. I've done some, I've done some work for Edmodo. Okay. So, I mean, they, I have a, well. they have a huge teacher presence, but I don't know if they're going to last. Um, yeah, Erica used them in college. I, I haven't used them for a long time. I frankly am worried that they're just going to tank. Um, so a couple things that I heard a lot about at ISTE and I always hear a lot about from teachers that I consider kind of the forefront of all this tech stuff is virtual reality. Though for the life of me, I don't think I've seen any initiatives in schools that have really pushed the boundaries of virtual reality. Um, this program, Nearpod, where they have viewfinders for students, they actually have some pretty cool curriculum um, experiences for kids to use. But again, it's curriculum. It's not, there's nothing like fundamentally different about the way that the student is learning. They're just getting access to something that they wouldn't otherwise see. Um, and Google Expeditions has done some work around that as well. They have their, their viewfinder that you can use with Android. Um, and Global Nomads, I'm glad you said that, Lucy, is also really cool. And I like them because they have an, a, a piece around um, global awareness. Um, it's, and a, it's an immersive tolerance. story. Like if you, if you yeah. do one of their things, it's, it's like an immersive story. They partnered with an app um, developer that does the New York Times immersive VR mm -hmm. stories. And mm -hmm. it used to be called Burst. It's now called something else. But you go in, like the one that I saw, you go into a kid's, um, it's like you're, you're visiting a kid who lives in a Jordanian um, refugee camp and you're mm -hmm. touring her house and her school and that sort of thing. So there's like a little bit more substance to it. Whereas mm -hmm. with expeditions, it's like a tour of Google Earth oriented stuff and you can kind of control it for your students. And yes, it's, it gets people into it, but the depth of learning is like, seems to be missing for me. You know, it's really yeah. fun. But like what happens after that? How do you really make that come to life even right. more? I guess right. that's good. Yeah. I'm a little worried about the shiny, shiny element of virtual reality of people going, oh, it's so cool. And, but what's the, what is, at the end of the day, what's the real impact? Um, you mentioned learning management systems before, Lucy. The ones that I hear a lot about these days are Canvas um, and Schoology. Blackboard seems to be losing a lot of footing. I think people kind of got sick of it. Um, I, if you want my personal opinion, I think that we're not doing a good enough job of financial literacy with kids, especially low-income kids. I didn't learn jack about financial literacy. I barely was able to write a check when I got to college. Um, EverFi, which actually has a huge office in Chicago, has done some really cool uh, curriculum work around financial literacy. I highly encourage you guys to check it out if um, you're interested in, in using that or can recommend it to somebody else. 
um, there's, there's the, there, there's the like super popular tools that I think, um, you tend to hear about a lot more like class dojo because classroom management is something that everybody struggles with. And it's nice to be able to have a tool that does support you. I don't think that class dojo particularly changes any of the ways that we're looking at classroom management. It's still sort of punitive. You know, you give points to a kid if they're doing well, or you take points away if they're not, but Hey, if it works, why not? And it's free for now. So, you know, and the same thing with Remind, a uh, really easy system where you can text parents without actually having to give them your phone number. Also really easy to use, also free. Also, I don't think really changing up the system in the classroom, but hey, again, super useful. I wonder about their business model too. Like how, I mean, they have probably tons of users, but like what, what does that translate to? Where do they go with that? I'm, I'm curious to see where they, where they pivot at some point. At um, this point, I think they're too big to close. So I think actually the users will be the one that will be okay. I think it's the company that might end up suffering because I could see them getting acquired by somebody for yeah, less yeah. money than they have venture capital. So, okay. All right. Yeah. That's interesting how that works. That's yep. a whole nother webinar. Um, yeah. Tori had a question um, mm -hmm. with, the with the plethora of information in the world and all the different viewpoints on technology and pedagogy today, how can Ed Surge be used in order to help um, get all the teachers and parents of a building on the same page. Mm, okay, great question. Um, so for one, I think that there are a couple of research, pro well, it depends on what you want to do with them. So if you're looking, for example, to bring in one-to-one -one article, one-to-one um, -one initiatives, I think there's some really critical key articles that are worth sharing with them so they can see how other schools have done it successfully. Um, Sometimes just proof, quote unquote proof, or um, a suggestion that it has worked for other people is, is useful for parents and teachers to see. So I think that personal stories are always a positive with that. Um, I'm also happy to share some of my stories based on what you're looking for or need uh, that I think have been really successful with teachers sharing them and getting parents on board after reading them. So, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, if... If you guys want to look, if you go to Ed Surge and you find Mary Jo's name, you search for it, you can find probably all the articles that she's written. I'm assuming with your bio, everything's written associated mm -hmm. there. So that's probably where they would find some of your articles that might highlight success stories, correct? I would also actually recommend checking out the 50 States Project. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. So we, for the last three years, we've done the 50 States Project where we've found one educator in all 50 states DC and Puerto Rico to write about something that they've done successfully in their school or district or classroom. And those I find really useful as well, because it's one thing if I'm reporting on it, but if you can actually get an educator to share how it worked with them, that actually might be easier to convince the parents with. Cause sure I was a teacher, but I haven't been in the classroom for a while. So it might, might not be able to trust me as much as someone who's actually doing yeah. it on the right. Side. Yeah. Okay, I just put the link to the 2017 one there. I'll, I'll find the 2016 one and put it in there as well. So that's perfect. So Yay. if you guys want some concrete examples of what teachers are doing, that's a mm -hmm. good go-to place. Mm -hmm. um, okay, if you guys have more questions for Mary Jo, put them in the Padlet. I'll send them to her and hope, and, and if she has time and her busy schedule, she'll get back to us. But I don't want to keep you later than um, what I had signed you up for. So thank you so much for doing this. And we really appreciate it. And you guys have gotten the insider view to ed tech from live from Silicon Valley, right? <laughs> They're close to it. Yeah. I'll make right. one more note too. If you guys ever have anything you want us to write about or you want to write about, you should absolutely feel free to connect with me. I love hearing from educators. So okay. Lucy knows where to find me too. So. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. That's awesome. And hopefully you have a few more subscribers uh, after tonight. Uh, that's, your newsletter and that's, that's awesome. Awesome. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks, Mary Jo. We appreciate it. Bye, guys. Bye. All right. So we're moving into part two, and we've got Christopher Hull here, and I see him lurking. Hi, Chris. How are you? I'm going to click on your, let's see if I can get you to pop up. Spotlight, make host, allow recording. What do I do? Put on hold. That's not what I want to do. Pin video. There you are. Okay. Awesome. And uh, so everybody, I'm, I'm, this is part two of our kind of our ed tech uh, startup. Um, webinar, I guess. And we have a local person here whose story I think will be really interesting to you because he's still working in the classroom and he really understands what teachers are doing. And I'm going to turn it over to Chris and let us and have him tell your, his story. 
and maybe give us a little bit of a guided tour of Otis so that you can see how it works and maybe you want to play around with it a little bit. And then we'll open up to questions. So how are you, Chris? I'm doing very good. How are you doing? Good. How's your you, summer? You guys hear me? Oh, it's going good. I can't believe how quickly it's going. It's flying by. Yeah. It's flying yeah. by. Are you, where are you so now? Are you in I'll, Highland Park or where are you? I'm at Fulton Market. I'm at the Otis office. Um, I have two kids under three, so I did not want to be home doing a webinar because you would have heard crying babies or something maybe <laughs> worse. So. Uh, so you guys moved, you guys, your offices used to be in Highland Park, weren't, weren't they? And then you moved down, did you move downtown since I last talked to you? Yeah. Yeah. We moved downtown. We're actually in the, the Google building. We're not in Google, but we're in the same building as the Google building. So I think since we met, we have uh, 24 people now working for Otis. So. Oh, wow. That's huge. So, that's huge. Okay. So I'm going to, so I'm going to. I'm going to turn it over to you and just tell us how this all started and where you are now and show us anything that you want to and uh, we'll we'll jump in as uh, as you go. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Um, always always odd talking. All right, so let's see if I can share my screen. Be an actual tech person. Um, so a little bit of background. Let's see if I. Can. I don't know, what screen are you guys seeing? Are you guys seeing a screen with a um, Otis yeah. student performance platform? Yeah. Oh, okay. I can see it, yep. Um, okay, so I am a seventh grade social studies teacher. Um, I've been teaching seventh grade social studies for the past 10 years. I teach in Highland Park at Elm Place Middle School. Um, I've been lucky enough to teach in the same school for all 10 years. Um, and I wanted to spend a little bit of time. I was listening to the amazing interview with Mary Jo and she, hers is going to be much better than mine. So I apologize for being second, but I did, I mean, I thought so much of what she said was interesting and I wanted to take a quick moment just to talk a little bit about my teaching before jumping into Otis. Um, it was really fascinating to hear her talk about summit and to hear her talk about, you know, Kip and some of the other ones. Um, so in my classroom, I really focus on, uh, three expectations with my kids. So I always tell them I want them to be honest. And we really spend the first four weeks of my class, and it does take a long time, about how we can be honest as a social studies teacher. That means what do you know? What don't you know? Um, what have you learned in the past? What are you able to do? And what are you kind of struggling to do? And we talk about being respectful. And the third expectation is to risk failure while striving to be your best. And those are the expectations that I always had with my, my students. And um, in part, that meant that I had to be honest with them. And in part, I had to be um, always striving to be my best. And so that led um, to my pursuit uh, about five years ago, where my colleague, Pete Helfer, he was a sixth grade social studies teacher. He and I were constantly trying to find ways to improve the learning for our students. Um, and we had this idea, and I want to give Pete ample credit because he is a tinkerer. He knows how to tinker. And so what we were going to try to do is we were going to take Indigo Max, and we were going to take the Indigo Max that were about to be um, disposed of in our district. We're going to get a new computer lab, and we were going to take them apart, take the RAM out of one computer, and put it into a second computer. And basically, with the RAM of two computers, we were gonna be able to have these computers continue and to keep working. Because we thought if we could provide a device for every kid, we could really open up our classrooms to an, in an amazing way. Uh, we wrote a grant and we actually, instead of getting the Indigo Max, um, we must have had a really persuasive paper. I don't know quite how we did it, but we actually got one-to-one -one iPads um, for the entire social studies department. And um, with those iPads, um, we began to investigate. And I was a big fan of anybody on ed tech. Um, that's actually, I started following Lucy, I followed you, I followed Richard Byrne, you name it, I was trying to find it. And I actually tried myself to write a little bit of a blog post. I reviewed over 5,000 different apps and websites. I don't think I had more than 50 followers, but it was a really interesting way of learning about ed tech. Um, and, some of the things you were saying in your first interview really hit home. Technology is not a solution. 
I actually, during times I've been lucky enough to present, I always tell people technology actually exposes your teaching practices. If you're a good teacher, technology is going to amplify what you do. If you are a teacher that struggles with classroom management, if you're a teacher that struggles with content, it's actually going to expose some of those um, issues that are harder to deal with. And um, we ended up with the iPad, started working in the classroom and working with students. Um, and the picture that's on the screen, you can actually see wood blocks uh, trying to create a stand for the iPad. And um, we were doing this, and we ended up meeting a Chicago businessman named Andy Bloom. Uh, he had been friends with the eighth grade English teacher in our building. And the eighth grade English teacher had, uh, he, Andy asked our teacher, the eighth grade English teacher, uh, Leslie, hey, do you know anybody who knows about ed tech? And she pointed Andy to Pete and I. And what we ended up deciding or ex expressing was the idea that the technology, and it's, I apologize that the slide shows in third person, I took this and didn't edit it. Um, but we realized that it was an amazing amount of potential available for everyone. Um, there were, but the, all these apps, I mean, we had students using 18, 20 different apps, and it was disconnected, it was fragmented. We had to teach my students so often how to use the app versus how to read, write, and think. Um, kind of going back to my classroom just for a quick second, my classroom, what I tell my students they're gonna learn is they're gonna learn to read, write, and think critically and independently. And in seventh grade social studies, we focus on who is a person and who is a citizen and what rights do they have. And that's a really hotly debated topic. And if you're gonna be able to think critically and independently, you're gonna need content from different places. You're gonna need classroom structures and lesson plans. Um, but they ended up just doing tool diving and you know one-off apps. And what we had told Andy and what we have built with Otis, so Otis is a student performance platform. And the idea is that it's going to bring several different tools into one place. And um, it's one integrated platform. Otis is built for the K-12 um, environment. It's really meant to unify the school community. Um, I'm somebody who uses and has used in the past Remind. Now with Otis, we have a tool that's similar. Um, there are things like Class Dojo. Um, they, you know, are a behavior recognition tool. Well, you know, within Otis, we also have those tools. Um, the idea that there is amazing content like Newzella or Crash Course History or unbelievable things that we could talk all day about, but you can integrate them into a system. And that is kind of what Otis does. We are a platform. And so what we do is we bring together a classroom management tool, a learning management tool, an assessment management tool, and that all feeds our data management and data analytics. And it's been built. It. Uh, it's been built for five years. Um, classroom first. You know, my students, um, as a teacher, I'm still in the classroom. I'm lucky enough to teach. There's other people who do all the building and selling and support, um, but I'm lucky enough to teach because um, every year the classroom changes, and we want to integrate these tools into one system. And the end goal is to be able to provide the most complete profile we can for each student. We don't want the student to be a number or something on the screen. And that's one of the things that I also heard Mary Jo talk about. If you were to come into my classroom, um, we're one-to-one -one Chromebooks now. So if anybody wants to know how rolling out one-to-one -one Chromebooks is compared to one-to-one -one iPads, I can definitely talk all about that. We're now one-to-one -one Chromebooks. But if you were to enter my room, um, my desks are whiteboard desks. We had bought whiteboard paint, and my students love to take notes via um, dry erase marker. Um, we, I believe in project-based learning. So, you know, for example, we do the epic rap battle of the three branches of government. So my students get to take one of the branches of government, and they get a rap why their branch is the best. Or um, we have a marketing project where we, during the colonies, we are, they have to market and we talk about marketing techniques. You can be a positive marketing or negative marketing about why people should move to your colony. Um, 
And we do various projects throughout the year. And the idea is Otis is kind of the background and the hub, but so much of it's taking place in terms of the students will sketch out on their desk what they want to envision in terms of their marketing project. There are whiteboards around the classroom, so they're able to get up and talk through. Um, they're able to create videos, and they're able to create all of that. Um, and so I'm kind of going back and forth. I should have had a better plan as a teacher, but Otis is allowing you to generate data. Um, it gives you the, the leaders and the it's teachers and students and parents, and it's this ability of having one community where you're able to see um, positive and negative recognition. You're able to create groups. So I can create groups based upon demographics, but I can also create it based upon um, their NWEA scores or their assessment scores or their interests. Maybe they just love coding. I can actually create a group based on that. Um, I can take attendance. I can take participation. Um, we connect to third parties. So again, my district really believes in NWEA. Um, we also use PARC as an Illinois um, district. Um, we're able to pull in that data so that when I'm looking um, and talking to my students, we're able to pull that in together. Um, I really believe in conferences. So I believe in project-based learning, but I also believe in uh, mini conferences. So I actually, once every two weeks, I will meet with my students and we'll, at the various points of the year, talk about different things. To begin the year, it'll be about who are they. Uh, we have a connection to a tool called Thrively, which is a, a strength assessment. We also use, um, we're lucky enough to use something called MindPrint. And that was in a way to get to know my kids. Um, as we continue, we'll also talk about um, their writing. Um, and Otis has a really tight integration with Google. So you can actually share, um, just like Google Classroom, but you can share a copy of a sentence starter with your entire class. But then in Otis, in the side-by-side -side grading, you can actually grade and leave comments. But comments alone in the doc are a great way to start, but it's also great to actually have conversation about why did you use that introduction or how are you supporting that idea. Um, and what really separates Otis is the idea that all of this is done and you can then run analytics to gain insight and create action. Um, you're able to uh, group kids based upon their ab ability, based upon their passion. And you're able to act because we combine a learning management system with a classroom management system with an assessment engine. Um, we have um, over 60 different item types. And this is all stuff that you can do. And the idea of why we try to keep Otis and we continue to motivate and something that we always want is Otis to get better and better is that this is something I would want to just, we're not driven by data. I hope we're informed by data. And the idea is that we love this infinity loop because it's not like you do something and you're done. Um, one of the reasons I like NWEA and not to you know, talk too much is I think every assessment in a child's career should be a formative assessment. Um, nothing in my mind is ever summative. Now I know at some point, you know, SIS grading systems and other reports seem summative, but I try to teach my kids that everything is formative because you can take everything and learn from it and adapt and improve and grow. And it's one of the things that you know, I, I really try to have with them. Um, we support ESSA, kind of skipping through this stuff um, just to kind of get to it. Um, but I did want to show a little bit about what Otis is. And now I'm trying to get back to the screen so that I can see everything and not sure about how to do that. You can, um, um, if you click the green, uh, share button you can unshare and then share again that might work okay you're sharing unshare your desktop. and share oh you're sharing yeah, you your de you're sharing your desktop too so i think if you switch to a different window it, it would it would do that too but yeah hey, yeah so that was a, a relatively 12 minute I, i'll be told by everybody at otis that i went way too quickly um <laughs> but i wanted to in, i wanted to integrate my role as a teacher um, with Otis. And so, I mean, the, the parts that I think are, I love being in the classroom with my kids um, and with Otis, it's an amazing experience to see firsthand how it's going. I was amazed at some of the questions that were in on the side here with Mary Jo and the fact that there's no, nothing better than teaching and nothing that really um, gets me motivated like teaching. 
Um, and Otis is a way of trying to provide some of the, a single platform to be able to do that. Um, almost um, our chief operating officer is a former principal. Our, um, we have like seven or eight former educators on staff. And really, Otis is just um, a tool. And it's similar to School of Gene Canvas, but it really tries to bring the data management and the data warehouse piece to it as well. But I didn't want to be this uh, full Otis plug in commercial. That's not really. I wanted to make sure that it was uh, informative. No, you're fine. I did see a question from Pete. I did see a question. Pete is actually at Arlington Heights now. Ah. Um, oh, so good. Oh, good. Pete, so, yeah. So, a little bit of background. Of Pete, Pete. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I know the tech um, director in, in Arlington Heights, and I'm surprised that if, I hope they're using it. Um, and I hope that his name is Chris Fano. I don't know if you've met him, um, but I bet he would love this. Yeah. And so, I mean, so we have some, I didn't get into the weeds, like we have some really cool functionality in terms of um, our analytics. So you can do like an item analysis on assessment. So you can know how kids fit on each item. Um, you can also do something called query, which is where you're allowed to search for um, a population of students based on criteria. And so we really had listened um, to the administrative feedback where it's like, I want to find out who are my students who need to go in advanced math. And in order to be in advanced math, they need to get a 230 on NWEA. They need to get a 85% on the benchmark that is a district benchmark. And they also need to get an A or a B in math. And so in the past, that's Google Sheets. Well, now with Otis, you can do that all within in one system. So. That makes it a lot um, easier. Yeah. Do, have you, so with, in terms of the classroom use, have you used your students as guinea pigs in terms, you know, in terms of figuring out features and having them use things and, and giving you feedback out of curiosity? Yeah, I mean, guinea pigs is a word that I, I would hate to use. I don't think they would like it. They <laughs> love the fact that they have a say. I think that any 12 and 13 year old wants to have a say. And um, it's been really fascinating because they get it better than almost anybody else. Um, I had a, a superintendent come visit my classroom and they're actually new to our district. And they came in, they're like, so what do you use Otis for? And it was funny because the student just goes, I don't know, school. And that was like a great compliment to me because it wasn't like a special tool. It was like, oh, so what do you do? Oh, when we did our epic rap battle, you uploaded the video and you did a video that was posted to YouTube with a Google district. Um, when they had their resources, it was all collected in one place, um, but it really wasn't a silver bullet. They still remembered the learning part, um, but they definitely give feedback. And as I talked about honesty being such an important part, they have been, I don't know the last time you saw it, Lucy, but if you, like a year ago or two years ago, it's gotten so much better. So they always comment and they love like, oh, I told you it would be easier if, and it's like, it's great to have that, but that it's just a great way for them to be able to share honesty of like, hey, I struggle with my paper, but this is something that you could improve too. And it gets a good back and forth. And it sounds like they, I mean, it's, it's exciting for them to see like how their feedback has helped improve this product over time. I think that's, I mean, I just, yeah. think, I think you're setting a really interesting example for your students in so many different ways. And, and not only in it, just in, um, being entrepreneurial in your mindset and how you approach learning as an entrepreneur too. I mean, I, I think it all kind of goes together. Um, is everybody using it in Highland Park or do you just use it in your classroom or, or, or have they, have your colleagues bought into it? I think that would probably be, it's always hard to no, get. No, that's a really good question. Board. Yeah. So it was actually really funny. So when we started, we didn't want to push it on any of our colleagues in the first year. We didn't want to be like, you have to use this. And we still don't. I mean, it's something that we haven't. But what has ended up happening, um, actually, so I'm the seventh grade teacher. So the first year, teach kids who were sixth grade, they used it. My seventh graders used it. And actually, the, the year after, the eighth grade students converted all the teachers, or I'd say 80%. I don't want to say all, but 80%. And they're like, because they were using Edmodo. This was a couple of years ago. And they're like, why are you doing this? Otis is better. Um, and so now a lot of our school is using it. Um, I don't know. I don't want to get too into the weeds in politics. There's been a change in 112. There's been a, a new superintendent we're looking for. And uh, 
we have a new uh, curriculum person, a new person, and the decision hasn't been made for the entire district. Um, so I don't want to speak to any of that because um, I know they're just starting uh, just a week ago or 10 days ago. Yeah. Um, but my building does. My building does use it. Um, but it's been very organic, which is the way I was always told. It's one of those things where my school district has always been amazing. They, they understand, like, I do, first and foremost, what's best for my students. And Otis is never, it never has to be used in the district, but there are a lot of teachers in, in the district who do use it. And there are over 50 districts overall who use it. Um, we have 50 users, 50 district users now, um, and hopefully more as we grow. Chris, would you be able to show us like a screen from what you see as a teacher using Otis? Of course. Oh yeah, I could definitely do that. Uh, that's definitely something I can do. If I can figure out screen share. Hold on. Yeah. Um, you might have yeah. to log, in, log into your account on your browser and then the, click the green button um, at the yeah, bottom. Yeah, I just have to click the, I just have to click share. I just have to do, I'm logging in right now. I just don't like when it says the screen share. It's hard for me to know which screen I'm sharing. I know, I know. I it does, it looks like it does it. There's a, it does it. Um, you know what's actually a cool thing about Zoom, just FYI everyone, is that you can um, screen share from your iPhone or your iPad via AirPlay or a cable. I think that's the kind of the coolest feature. So you can be looking at this on your computer and then screen sharing from your phone. Um, but anyway, yeah, go ahead and show us. I, I would give us a drive, a driving uh, tour of what we would see. Go ahead. Yeah, I can definitely show you a tour of what you can see. So one of the things about Otis, and I always forget to mention, and I should, is for teachers, for teachers, it's free. Um, so as an individual teacher, you can use it for free. Um, districts, um, if a district wants it, there is a district cost. <clears throat> so as I have all my browsers open here. Sorry. I was about to log into the wrong place. But yeah, it's one of those things where as a teacher and a student sees the same and there's also a family portal and there's also an administrative portal, but I can definitely show you what it looks like. Um, sorry, I guess I was in too many Gmail accounts. So. I have that problem often too. <laughs> well, it's never fun when you're trying to show tech and you're trying to show it quickly and all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's not loading immediately. As you can see, I was looking at Everfy. I was following along the, the I Maddie. see, yeah. I'm I sorry, the Mary Jo, I was following along. I saw. Um, so, I, I'm logged into my Otis account. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So, can you guys see my screen now? Yeah, we're good. I think sorry. good. Okay. Um. Yeah. So this is what it looks like from the um, teacher version, and so you can see that these are my different classes. Um. So I taught. I have a a demo class, but you can act. Anybody can add a demo class actually, um, if they want to play around and see it. But the other ones are my actual real students. Um. And then one of the things that you're able to do is we have many of the tools that I was mentioning. So for example, you can assign recognitions and recognitions are very much like class dojo. Um, I can create positive or negative. Um, but one of the cool parts is you can have district recognitions. And so district recognitions will allow you to run like a PBIS framework. Um, and you can give a recognition to students or you can do flags and so flags which we're actually about to rename in just a week because we learned everybody calls them groups, are just groups of students. Also from the screen, you can take an attendance. And so when you take attendance, it actually does sync with um, most SIS systems. So you can take attendance right from the screen. Um, again, you can randomly call on people. And so all of a sudden it'll track that data and information. Um, with the mailbox, you can actually send um, texts and emails to students and their families, and you're able to um, be able to do this pretty quickly. Um, 
We have a lesson, so you can actually send a lesson full of activities um, if you want to preview. So I can have different things. So this was my Bill of Rights and Amendment unit. So they had an amendment. So they had to complete the research in a Google Doc. And then they had a game they had to play. So it was kind of like a playlist, if you would say, a playlist of information. Um, we have a bookshelf, which is where you curate and share resources. Um, so again, you have different things. The last unit we do is genocide. Um, we talk about what happens if you fail to protect the rights of citizens. And here you're able to have folders and you can share them either with classes, with um, individual students, if there's something an individual student would like, or flag. Um, assessment. Um, so I didn't want to get too into the weeds, but we, we are going there, I guess. But um, in the assessment, we have items that you can create, and we actually have an item bank. We actually um, currently have the inspect item bank with over 77,000 items, um, or you can create items on your own. And um, so if we were to look at some of the assessments that I have, we have um, quite a few different types. Um, so we have uh, different types of questions. Um, shouldn't have done that. Um, we have different types. We have 75 different item types. Um, and um, those different item types range from drag and drop to uh, highlighting. And I was going to show you a preview. And then I wanted to show you a different preview. And I am now showing you a loading screen. Um, sorry about that. <clears throat> Who would think that I'm a tech person with all these tech issues? And it's one of those things I keep on it might be your, clicking things, trying to make it better. It might be your speed because it's, it's, it's running fine on mine. It's going pretty quickly on my machine. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely fast. It's, um, so you, these are some of the different types you have. So you can have um, highlight. So here's the highlight version. We can highlight different ones. Um, so you can actually say which part of the text show that they're fast, and you can actually highlight. So it actually is kind of like smarter balance or part testing. So I could cool. actually create, not that we want to go too far into this, but we have all these different um, uh, grading scales. So you can have a custom grading scale or you can use mastery. Um, it's one of those elements that you can also have rubrics and items, but you have all of this ability to create the different types of questions you want. Um, multiple choice, fill in the blank, um, you can classify, you have written, you have highlight, you have math. One of the big, uh, we really listen to the math community and how the math community often feels like they can't give these type of assessments. So that was one of the reasons we really brought it in. Um, we have a grading book, we have a points grading book, and we have a standards grading book. Is there um, the ability for a district to create their own assessments in, in, collectively and then shoot it out to the teachers somehow? Like, can you do it at that level? A hundred percent, yes, 100 percent. That is, that's a huge reason that a lot of districts do it. You create district benchmarks and then you can share. So I'm in the teacher version, but, and I can go into the admin one if we want to, but the admin one is kind of like a level up. So you can actually create teacher flags. So um, we have some of our districts who will create the sixth grade math assessment, and then they share it out. And then the cool part, so we also have a poll. I'll go, I can go into some of these. We also have a blog. I want to be a little careful because these are my actual students. Um, but then we have the analytics. And so what really kind of separates us is we actually have analytics for, um, I actually did my para in Otis. Um, so I actually this year did para and I was able to track this and I will get to your benchmark, but you can create these assessments and all of a sudden you can see, I won't go to the kids, but I can say here are the kids on the assessment and how they did and how they grew. You know, this is the benchmark. I had, you know, it was one of those things that was really cool. But we also have that with NWEA where you can look at their NWEA scores. We have that with park. Um, and then, to your point and to the assessment piece, 
this is a really amazing piece that you can get to is you can do item analysis on that district level assessment. So I'm at the teacher level, but you can do this at the admin level. So you can go in and say, oh, I really want to know how my kids did on, uh, let's say, I'm trying to think which one we should do. Um, actually, not, not the retake. I did allow a couple of my students to retake the Constitution test. Um, well, let's do the Constitution test. You're able to break down how kids did on various elements, and you can actually see question by question. And you can do that for a rubric as well. I think um, one of the problems so with, do, I was just going to say that one of the problems I think with data collection and how everybody's gone crazy with it in schools is that everybody collects and collects and collects, but then the time and the mechanisms for analyzing it and deriving some meaning about how that's going to change your instruction. Uh, I don't know how well that, that happens <laughs> in comparison. So like this would, this seems to me that this would make it really easy to have those kinds of conversations, like what's working, what's not working, what do I need to reteach, um, you know, where are our weak areas, you know, or where are our areas of strength? Yeah, I think I think you nailed I think you nailed that it. it's the ability to act on the data. I mean, you can collect and collect and currently it's in a lot of different places, but can you make it meaningful? Um, so if you click these, I, these are my real students. So I, I don't want to do that. But so this was my first current event and this is a writing assignment they did. And you could see the goal was for kids to get to um, to score a, a 25. And so I actually had 28 students who did that right away. I'm actually was able to create a group, a flag in Otis. And these students were able to then work on some of the, um, the skills that were a little bit higher level. Um, supporting evidence with textual support. And we could then say, okay, multiple times. Um, I had the other students, you know, I had 75 students in this kind of medium range who scored between a 20 and a 25. And I was able to create a group for them, even though it was 90 kids, and they were really working on creating a stronger summary. And then I had two students who really um, needed a lot of intervention. And it was actually, they were actually identified in a different group. They actually were IEP students. But I was able to target them with additional lessons because those flags I can create here, they actually can carry over into um, the rest of Otis. And again, it's not to say that this is the be all end all. Instead, it's, this is the baseline of hey, we had a day-to-day, -day, or we have an investigation, we have a conversation, now let's actually use this to be meaningful um, so that when I have a conference on writing, I'm able to do that. So I showed you item-based. You can also have rubric-based assessments, um, and we have some really cool features coming where those are side-by-side -side with Google. Um, so you can actually see the screen. So, sorry. Yeah, and I have like five million questions, and I think um, some of the students do too. One of my questions is, is it, could the teachers also create lessons, if they create their own lessons, it, is there a shared bank that they can be deposited into for everybody in the district to look at? Or I'm assuming that there's some way for them to share them individually, but is there a way to kind of like organize them so a teacher could go grab a lesson if they need some need to or whatever? That's, I mean, that's definitely something we're working towards. And I know that's yeah. like the biggest tech answer possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, currently, you can create a lesson and you can share it with everybody. Um, and we're talking about and we're trying to figure out the best way of having like a repository. Um, a district can have a repository of item banks. Um, lessons are something that we're trying to, we, we've, there's been some really cool ways. And you can create playlists and you can share them as a district. Okay. Um, but right now, it has to be, we got into an interesting, and I'd actually be interested in your students' opinions. Um, when is it okay to share something and when is it not? So like our bookshelf, if you, we default that you can share, but it's like, do you want it to be shared? Some teachers are like, hey, I don't know if I want to share that. So right now we're going, because it was a good first step, we're going to share um, on, a, on request. And a district can share out what's been created, but that's kind of what we've done. And it's something we're kind of talking about though. Okay. Do you guys, um, students, do you have students? I feel like I should say peers because students sounds ridiculous at our age, but um, it doesn't sound ridiculous, but it's, anyway, peer, my, my fellow uh, TIE participants, do you guys have any feedback for Chris? Like on, do you want to ask him some questions about features 
or do you have suggestions or do you want to do you want to tell him about how you how do you feel about making things public and sharing and that sort of thing any 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 thoughts there quick... and while you ask that okay oh um so i was so... just saying that this is the side by side i'd mentioned i for, i forgot i didn't pull it up but your google doc is here and it's a live google doc so i can actually comment on it and then I'm actually able to grade at the very same time in a rubric. Um, so, I sorry, I did not mean to cut you off. I apologize. Laura, did uh, you have a question? I did. I don't know. Did anyone else have one? Um, I was going to say, so in my district, we're one-to-one -one with Chromebooks. So for our students, um, we use something called like Hapara to view what are they doing on their computer at all times when they're hooked or are on the, the district Wi-Fi. So does Otis have a component like that where our student, we can kind of monitor or is it kind of like we have to have two systems? Yeah, so Hapara, I do know Hapara really well. And Hapara does a great job of controlling like the screen, like you can see what's on the screen. Um, Otis does not do that. Um, you can do the sharing. So like, you know, in Google Classroom and in other systems, it's like, I want to share a copy. I want to share a document. Um, so Otis does do that. Um, we don't do the screen share. Like we, we don't do like the screen monitoring. Um, it's something that I think would be really cool. Um, that's why I love being in the classroom because I definitely know why that's useful. Um, but it, I always hate to say no because it makes me feel bad, but currently not. <laughs> Um, what, uh, Doug was curious um, as to whether this could be used with PD, in-house PD cohorts. Uh, is there a way to, to do that? And have you seen anybody use it in that way? Yeah, so a couple of our districts are doing it um, as like a PD session so that an, a district would just create, um, so I've seen it done two ways. So a district can create a PD cohort for their entire teachers and that's worked really pretty well. I've also seen people use the free version because the district won't say that you use the free one and you have a teacher, anybody can join your student account. And all of those analytics I was showing you are available in, in the student, in the teacher version. Um, they're only analytics that are not available are the query analytics that's district based. Everything else is available in the teacher version. I saw a question from Erica about um, tracking data year to year. Um, and the answer is yes. Um, the NWEA is, you can go back as many years. We have some districts with 10 years of NWEA data. And so that means for some kids, their third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade tests are all in there and you can see their growth on one. Okay, anybody else have a question? Okay, any else have any questions or feedback or what kinds of features do you need in a, in a, you don't call us, you call us a, what do you call this now? It's not a, a student collaborate. What do you call it? It's not a learning management system. That's not the word that you it's use. It's a student, per, we call it a student performance platform. Okay, student performance platform. And so we are, out, we're, yeah. Yeah. I think I like that better. We're an LMS, a data, yeah, we're a, a learning management system, a classroom management system, a data warehouse, and an assessment engine, hopefully in one system, so. Okay. So I've got a, a couple of, of questions for you. Um, one of the things that when, when I'm leading a performance-based inquiry at a school, we spend um, about a week working with teachers to help them identify learning. Like, how do we know when learning is happening? And for whatever reason, North American teachers have a really hard time with that. We love and we can talk really well and really easily about what teachers do and whether or not they're being, um, their instructional practices are, are, are quality or not, but we struggle with identifying the learning, right? And so I guess my first question is, this is giving me a lot of data, it's giving me a lot of evidence. Do you have any stories about how teachers have used what, I mean, I'm seeing this as a, a funnel, right? It's a great single funnel that catches a whole lot of information in what, you know, do you have any stories about how teachers have used elements from this performance data to actually talk about student learning and whether or not it's happening, even though there's lots of performance going on? 
Yeah, I think that's like, I think that is like the, the, the billion dollar question, the million dollar question. I don't know if I can come up with, um, the idea is the we have question. to turn the focus. So yeah, we have to turn the focus to learning, right? And I think that is something that is interesting when you ask people, and I'm going to go a little bit on a tangent because I'm a history teacher and I just do that, but I will answer the question. That is like, we were talking about assessments today in the office and the idea is like, why do you give an assessment? Really, it should be to measure something and you should know what you want to measure before you give the assessment because otherwise, why are we taking the time to do that? And what, I, what we've seen, and there are examples of when you can actually collect data in a funnel using your, the analogy, you can actually track things. So there's, um, I could use me. I always want to go to me, but I'll try not to go to me. Um, so there was a district, for example, that really wanted to focus on the writing. And they wanted to break it down, not even writing. They wanted to look at being able to summarize informational text. And they wanted this to be done not just in social studies class or English class, but in social studies, English, and science. Um, so what they ended up doing with Otis is that they created a custom standard. Even though they could have used Common Core, this was a state that didn't like Common Core. So they created a custom standard, in which you're able to do in Otis, and they began to attach it to the student work that was being done. And it actually started the conversation as a PD almost of, hey, in science, we wrote this summary of the experiment. We attached this to the standard. This is how the student performed. And they were using mastery, um, near mastery. And they began to have this conversation of, are they actually being valid in their assessment of informational writing across the curriculum? So you had science, social studies, and English. And what it ended up doing is it actually focused them. And then they began using the same language within all classes. Oh, OK, are you answering the basic question? Are you um, providing the proper information? So after that conversation happened, because they were actually able to compare students' performance on this one supposed standard, they were actually able to do it on a common system. They began to have the conversation, which in turn, they were successful because they had their students grow. And their more students, and I'd have to look at the exact number, but more students had reached this mastery in the year with Otis than in the years past, even though they had the goal. But part of it is you can't talk about what is a kid supposed to learn unless you're all doing in the same system. It's like if you have different currencies, how much are you making? Well, I'm making X number of euros versus X number of dollars. At some point, we got to speak a language in a district to be able to actually focus on that. Well, I don't know I, if I got to it. I thought I did. Yeah, I mean, I think what what is really exciting about teaching now is that these programs like Otis, platforms like Otis, allow us to see the information, right? Like, like you're saying, um, you have to know what you want to know before you start the assessment or before you set up the database. Like, what is it that we want to know about? Um, so we're sure to capture it. And the great thing is that these things help us capture it. But the real power is exactly how you just finished. It's the conversation that evolves out of being able to visualize that finally. Um, and where do, what does that tell us you know, um, about student learning, teacher instruction, and what are the next steps that we have to, have to take? So um, you know, I love that this will make, make that visible and be, be the catalyst and the source for those conversations ongoing. You know, just thinking about yeah, that, think just to follow up on that, those kinds of conversations never happened when I first started teaching. Everybody went in their classroom, shut the door, and hoped that nobody came in to observe you because it was such a, I, I taught in CPS for the first eight years. It was so punitive and so judgmental and unsupportive of brand new baby teachers. And they're yeah. still not easy now. And even yeah. finding the yeah. time to do it, but at least when you've got, yeah. I think when these, when the information is more easily um, visualized, it, it kind of spurs on like the, let, let's make this a priority. Look at all this cool information we have, you know, what does it mean? Uh, and, and it's still really hard, but at least we are able to see it in, in kind of do something with it, you know? Yeah, I agree. It's, I think it's a, a big, it's really evolved. That visibility piece is, is essential. I mean, and when you when you have to go to seven or eight different systems, it's hard to have it. I mean, when I started teaching, I 
10 years ago, we didn't have day to days. And then all of a sudden we did like year seven or eight. Well, now you can actually act. And until you can act and experiment and try stuff out, it becomes hard to actually know what to do. I mean, imagine if you had to learn something the very first time. And I think that's really what we're hoping to do is put people on a common platform with a common structure, with that common structure, common standards, common language, common grading scales, you can collect with a bigger funnel how a student's doing, and then you can do the actual teaching. I mean, I related to my classroom, like my classroom is whiteboard desks and they're talking and they're, I would hate to see my kids like typing on their screen um, instead of like turn to the person next to you and let's talk it out. And I think sometimes as teachers, we want to be able to do that too. We want to be able to say, hey, here is a, a data wall, which Otis has a data wall. Here's a data wall. Let's talk about it. Now I can act. Oh, I made a group. Here's a lesson for my kids. But it was still a conversation. Um, I saw another question just about the Otis gradebook being downloadable. So if, if you're a district, we connect to the SIS and we can actually pass the grade back to the gradebook. So it's one entry. So you enter it into Otis and it can go back and forth for most SIS. Systems. Not all are nice. Like PowerSchool actually does do that. It works well. Um, we do allow you to download it and enter it, um, but I'm just trying to make sure I answer. I always like to, um, it's always my, weird doing it. I'm used to a classroom where people can ask me and just yell out. Yeah, yeah, and my class is kind of shy, so they won't necessarily yell out. They could if they wanted to. Uh, they're just getting used to me in this in this format, I think. Um, one of the things, I, well, I'm thinking, Stephanie, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm thinking that you're thinking that your district's not probably going to buy Otis and have it connect to the SIS. And so that you would probably use it individually and then you would want to be able to take the, the grades out and, and easily put them into whatever your district is currently using. Is that what you're thinking, Stephanie? Yeah, okay. If you can download this, you can download the CSV um, and it should be relatively easy. Another element of Otis and I'll, in Otis, if you guys signed in, I could show you. In the bottom right, corner of Otis, I should show you, but there is actually a little bubble and we actually have chat support. And so one of the things that we believe, and it kind of goes, I, I believe it's Douglas's is, is point was, it has to be a community. And so we have, I said former educators. So we actually have former educators there because uh, we don't think Otis is an initiative, it's a tool. And a tool needs to be able to accomplish what you need it to do. And so we really take ease of use, but also support really seriously because um, I read in the Mary Jo thing again, the fact like there's a new initiative every like 18 months. And it's like, again, there are so many districts and I, there's so many districts where it's like, you'll have 10 initiatives in one year. And then the year after you'll have eight new ones. And it's like, I don't know which of the 18 we're still doing. And so we want to really make sure that we provide the support. And so there's going to be questions that come up of like, Hey, how do I use this? And we want to make sure that you can, always type here and get a response during the school day really quickly can i can you before we close can you elaborate a little bit more on what collaboration looks like in otis for your students like how would they do a project or assignment together would it be are there i mean would it would it be like them using a google doc that you've assigned or would yeah i, I don't know just somebody had asked a question yeah earlier. Yeah, so that's a great question. Yeah, and I, I definitely just saw that on the, um, the padlet you had. Um, so it's kind of done in a, in a couple different ways. Um, Google Docs is definitely the best collaborative doc. It just is, we're not gonna beat Google, but that's why we have such a close integration. So you can actually share out, um, you can actually share out the doc to the group you want. So let's say I had in my Epic Rap Battle uh, group, my executive branch, I could share the executive branch outline to that group because I've created that for them. And then they're working in the Google Doc. Um, there are other ways that they're able to collaborate in terms of um, doing lessons together, but really it's through the integration of Google that we really have that deep integration. And then it's being in a classroom together. Um, one, of, one of the things that I think people are still using Edmodo for, um, and I was shocked by what Mary Jo said, <laughs> but, um, uh, but not totally. But uh, one of the things is that for, for doing global projects with another classroom in another part of the world, which is a big part of what I do with teachers, 
um, they need a space, a safe space that is open to everyone, um, but with some protection. So like with Edmodo, you just have the code and you give it to the other class and they can get in. You don't have to worry about if you're at the same school or not. Um, and then you can have threaded conversations. You can, you know, share videos. You could, you could theoretically work on a Google Doc, I guess, um, if you put a link to an, an open doc without having to log in. Um, so is there, could you do that there it, with Otis too? I mean, could you create a class just for working with another school? Um, I'm guessing that there would be, there's a code, right, for joining a class. Yeah. They would have, the other class would have to make accounts in Otis and use that code to join, and then they could do this, all that same stuff, right? Yeah, so, yeah, so teachers, as I was saying, teachers and students and families are free to join Otis. So we've actually done, I've actually done like pen pal type thing where yeah, yeah. Um, we created a new combined class. So you create a class and then you have everything, like you have the blog post. So we actually did it with a CPS school. Um, so my students were blogging right next to the CPS students and all of a sudden they were able to kind of structure it, I'm sure, how a lot of colleges do it, where it's um, read three other blog posts and comment on them. And then the comments are threaded and you know, you're able to have those conversations. Um, there are some pieces like I, I used Edmodo in the past and it, it's definitely a social network. I mean, that's what it was really built yeah, to yeah. do. Otis is a little bit different. And so you have to structure it a little bit more like a K-12 classroom, but you can definitely collaborate okay. um, in ways once you get into the system with the code. Okay. And then the last question from Karen here, and this, this would actually be helpful to everyone. Are there a list of supported grade books and other systems that districts are using? that connect with, well with Otis. If you have a list of integrations, that would be awesome. Yeah, I said I can definitely get that. Um, I, it's a, it, I have a PDF and I just don't know if it's, I wanna get, we added a couple more. I wanna update, it's over okay. 60. Okay, um, you can email it to so me. I can definitely, email it to everybody that, I'll email it to you. Okay. okay. Yeah, um, I definitely have, I have a list. I just wanna make sure I can get the complete one because we just added a few more that are possible. Okay, that's so. fabulous. Uh, it sounds like, you know, it's been at least a year since I've talked to you. So it sounds like you guys have really grown and are thriving and making some good traction. So hooray for you guys. It's wonderful. Well, well thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it's been a crazy journey going from Pete and I talking about renovating Indigo Max. And now we have over 50 districts and there's, I still am a teacher. I mean, I'm a teacher first and it's like I, I come into the office and there's you know, 20 plus people just doing amazing things. And they're the rock stars. They, yeah. They've picked it up and run with it. I don't, I just stay in the classroom and say, hey, this is what I hope it can do. So. Well, that's, a, that's an awesome role. You must be quite busy with two little kids and, and this and teaching. I can't, I can't imagine how you do it, but hooray. I'm, you know, I'm, I, I'm really glad to see how this has turned out. And it's, it's, it, it looks great and fabulous, it, even more so than when I saw it the last time we talked. So, um, if, if we have any more questions, we have your contact information and everybody, I recommend you getting in there and playing with this and, and seeing if it will work for your classroom and you can't beat the price for free for at least doing that. And then if it's something that you feel like your district would, would benefit from, um, if you've used it, yeah, I think teachers are the best use cases when, when ed tech decisions come from teachers who have found something that really works for them and that they find compelling. I think that's the best case for adoption. Like I, I don't like top down decisions about we're doing this, we're doing this and we're not being flexible. When it comes from the teachers, that's, that's the best way I think. And, and, and this is a per perfect case of, of that happening. Um, next week, we are gonna do another webinar on Monday and I'm not, I haven't confirmed the people for it. I wanna do one with a friend who has a new interactive whiteboard product that sounds interesting. He's not available next Monday, so I'm trying to reschedule him. But I'm also want to do a session on assistive technology because it seems like an area that people have an interest in and don't know too much from the discussion forum post this week. And then um, talk about global projects too with a friend of mine who's in Australia and I'm gonna try and get her to, to um, do this, to come into one of our webinars. Um, so that's kind of what I'm tentatively planning for next week, but I have to, I have to pin down people and sometimes their schedules don't, aren't, aligned with ours. So we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, but anyway, I just want to thank you guys for coming and thank Chris and Mary Jo in absentia 
for being here tonight. Um, I think this is really useful and powerful and will relate to what we're talking about in terms of LMSs and ed tech tools in general this week. And I hope that you guys found it useful, okay? If you have any more questions, put them on the Padlet and I'll send them to Chris and Mary Jo and have a good night, guys. Mm -hmm.